So we are reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert T. Oyosaki. We are on in uh, the first lesson, page number 35 of the book and 25 of the PDF. The lesson begins. The lessons begin. Mike and I met with his dad that morning at 8 o'clock. He was already busy, having been at work for more than an hour. His construction supervisor was just leaving in his pickup truck as I walked up to his simple, small and tidy home. Mike met me at the door. Dad's on the phone and he said to wait on the back porch, Mike said as he opened the door. The old wooden floor creaked as I stepped across the threshold of the aging house. There was a cheap mat just inside the door. The mat was there to hide the years of wear from countless footsteps that the floor had supported. Although clean, it needed to be replaced. I felt claustrophobic as I entered the narrow living room that was filled with old, musty, overstuffed furniture that today would be collector's items. Sitting on the couch were two women both a little older than my mom. Across from the women sat a man in workman's clothes. He wore khaki slacks and a khaki shirt, neatly pressed but without starch, and polished work boots. He was about 10 years older than my dad. They smiled as Mike and I walked past them towards the back porch. I smiled back shyly. Who are those people, I asked. Oh, they work for my dad. The older man runs his warehouses and the women are the managers of the restaurants. And as you arrived, you saw the construction supervisor who is working on a road project about 50 miles from here. His other supervisor who is building a track of houses left before you got here. So, so... So if you see his father, although he owns the businesses, he's already been working for the last two hours, right? So that means he must have got up at five o'clock, done his preparatory work. Then all his supervisors came in. He has a meeting with all of them in the morning itself and then sends them out to work. So what does this show us, right? That he is not working. He is making other people work for him. Okay. So he has got only two hands. There's only so much that he can do. So you need to create a team for you to be able to do or expand. Basically, this is what he's getting at over here. Okay, I'm reading between the lines. Does this go on all the time, I asked? Not always, but quite often, said Mike, smiling as he pulled up a chair to sit down next to me. I asked my dad if he would teach us to make money, Mike said. Oh, and what did he say to that? I asked with cautious curiosity. Well, he had a funny look on his face at first, and then he said he would make us an offer. Oh, I said, rocking my chair back against the wall. I sat there perched on two rear legs of the chair. Mike did the same thing. Do you know what the offer is, I asked? No, but we'll soon find out. Shimangla, there's some noise in there. Shimangla? Yeah. There's some noise in your background. Can you still hear anything? No, now I can't. Suddenly, Mike's dad burst through the rickety screen door and onto the porch. Mike and I jumped to our feet, not out of respect, but because we were startled. Ready, boys? He asked as he pulled up a chair to sit down with us. We nodded our heads as we pulled our chairs away from the wall to sit in front of him. He was a big man, about six feet tall and 200 pounds. My dad was taller, about the same weight, and five years older than Mike's dad. They sort of looked alike, 
though not of the same ethnic makeup. Maybe their energy was similar. Mike says you want to learn to make money. Is that correct, Robert? I nodded my head quickly, but with a little trepidation. He had a lot of power behind his words and smile. Okay, here's my offer. I'll teach you, but I won't do it classroom style. You work for me, I'll teach you. You don't work for me, I won't teach you. I can teach you faster if you work, and I'm wasting my time if you just want to sit and listen like you do in school. That's my offer. Take it or leave it. So now what is Mike's dad telling him, right? That you need the knowledge and you need the experience. Only then you really learn. If you just have the knowledge, it is not learning. If you just have the experience, it is not learning. You have to have both to be able to make it work for you. Ah, may I ask a question first? I asked. No. Take it or leave it. I've got too much work to do to waste my time. If you can't make up your mind decisively, then you'll never learn to make money anyway. Opportunities come and go. Being able to know when to make quick decisions is an important skill. You have the opportunity that you asked for. School is beginning or it's over in 10 seconds. Mike's dad. So what is he saying over here? That you have to have that gut feel, that instinct to make a decision. So the point here is that most of the time, you know, we are saying no. We are constantly saying no, I can't, I won't. But the universe works with yes, I can, right? So that is the point over here. That he is saying that you have to have that feel, that gut feel to be able to take an instinctive decision. And again, when we look back at zero limits, when we were reading zero limits, there are three places that we can operate from. One is from memory. The other is from inspiration and then zero. So what he's talking about over here is not operating from memory to operate from inspiration where you get a gut feel that, okay, I need to do this and you simply just do it. Take it, I said. Take it, said Mike. Good, said Mike's dad. Mrs. Martin will be by in 10 minutes. After I'm through with her, you ride with her to my supperette and you can begin working. I'll pay you 10 cents an hour and you'll work three hours every Saturday. But I have a softball game today, I said. Mike's dad lowered his voice to a stern tone. Take it or leave it, he said. I'll take it, I replied, choosing to work and learn instead of playing. So again over here, right? We need to make a decision and we need to know that instinct has to be there that what is to our greater benefit and what is not to our greater benefit. And in life, we always have a choice. We have a constant choice. And again, over here, the four S's start to come up, right? We've already discussed it many times. Swata, Sahaj, Shresht, and Suikar. Now, if you see over here, what, what are the four are the four tenants being met? It came, the offer came to them, Swata, right? It came by itself. They did not know or did not work for getting the offer. Number two, is it easy for them to do? Yes, it is easy for them to do. Shreshd, is it the best choice? Is it better to go and play a softball game or to go and learn something for our greater good? So Shreshd, it is Shreshd. And the fourth is Swikar. When they accepted all four tenants, again, that's when the magic starts to happen. So these four S's are very, very important. In your life, you will find that anything that matches or takes care of these four tenants will work for you. If something is going wrong, you will always find that one of these four tenants has been violated. Thirty cents later, 
by 9 a.m. that day, <clears throat> Mike and I were working for Mrs. Martin. She was a kind and patient woman. She always said that Mike and I reminded her of her two grown sons. Although kind, she believed in hard work and kept us moving. We spent three hours taking canned goods off the shelves, brushing each can with a feather duster to get the dust off and then restacking them neatly. It was excruciatingly boring work. Mike's dad, whom I call my rich dad, owned nine of these little separates, each with a large parking lot. They were the early version of the 7-Eleven convenience stores, little neighborhood grocery stores where people brought items such as milk, bread, butter, and cigarettes. The problem was this was Hawaii before air conditioning was widely used and the stores could not close their doors because of the heat. On two sides of the store, the doors had to be wide open to the road and parking lot. Every time a car drove by or pulled into the parking lot, dust would swirl and settle in the store. We knew we had a job as long as there was no air conditioning. For three weeks, Mike and I reported to Mrs. Martin and worked our three hours. By noon, our work was over and she dropped three little dimes in each of our hands. Now, even at the age of nine, in the mid-50s, 30 cents was not too exciting. Comic books cost 10 cents back then, so I usually spent my money on comic books and went home. So now, what, what are they doing? They are working hard, right? And they are doing repetitive work, which is very important. Most of the time, what happens is that we get bored of something. But the more we repeat something, the more proficient we become at it. The other fact here, he earned 30 cents. And what did he do with that 30 cents? He went and bought comic books. Now, there is a lesson in this. And I'm sure going forward, he is going to learn the lesson of what, why, uh, where should he spend that 30 cents instead of buying comic books. By the Wednesday of the fourth week, I was ready to quit. I had agreed to work only because I wanted to learn to make money from Mike's dad. And now I was a slave for 10 cents an hour. On top of that, I had not seen Mike's dad since that first Saturday. So now, again, it is an attitude, right? So he's earning money. He needs to find the opportunity to learn from that experience. Whereas he is thinking that he has become a slave and he is ready to quit. Now, if you see most of the time when we are given a job, instead of doing the job for the sake of the job or for the sake of learning, we say, what am I getting out of it? And that is where the problem lies, right? Because doing the job itself is you're getting paid back. You're there for a certain reason. So if you can find that reason, then any job or anything that you're doing can become exciting. I'm quitting, I told Mike at lunchtime. School was boring and now I did not even have my Saturdays to look forward to. But it was the 30 cents that really got to me. This time, Mike smiled. What are you laughing at? I asked with anger and frustration. Dad said this would happen. He said to meet with him when you were ready to quit. What? So Mike's dad knew. Okay. Because why? He was experienced and he was wanting to teach uh, Robert a lesson. He was wanting to teach him a lesson from that particular job. What? I said indignantly. He's been waiting for me to get fed up. Sort of, Mike said. Dad's kind of different. He doesn't teach like your dad. Your mom and dad lecture a lot. My dad is quiet and a man of few words. 
You just wait till this Saturday. I'll tell him you're ready. You mean I've been set up? No, not really, but maybe. Dad will explain on Saturday. Waiting in line on Saturday. I was ready to face Mike's dad. Even my real dad was angry with him. My real dad, the one I call the poor one, thought that my rich dad was violating child labor laws and should be investigated. My educated, poor dad told me to demand what I deserve, at least 25 cents an hour. My poor dad told me that if I did not get a raise, I was to quit immediately. You don't need that damn job anyway, said my poor dad with indignation. At eight o'clock Saturday morning, I walked through the door of Mike's house when Mike's dad opened it. Take a seat and wait in line, he said as I entered. He turned and disappeared into his little office next to a bedroom. I looked around the room and didn't see Mike anywhere. Feeling awkward, I cautiously sat down next to the same two women who were there four weeks earlier. They smiled and slid down the couch to make room for me. Forty-five minutes went by and I was steaming. The two women had met with him and left 30 minutes earlier. An older gentleman was in there for 20 minutes and was also gone. The house was empty and here I sat in a musty, dark living room on a beautiful sunny Hawaiian day waiting to talk to a cheapskate who exploited children. I could hear him rustling around the office, talking on the phone and ignoring me. I was ready to walk out, but for some reason, I stayed. Finally, 15 minutes later, at exactly nine o'clock, Rich Dad walked out of his office said nothing and signaled with his hand for me to enter. I understand you want a raise or you're going to quit, Rich Dad said as he swiveled in his office chair. Well, you're not keeping your end of the bargain, I blurted out, nearly in tears. It was really frightening for me to confront a grown-up. You said that you would teach me if I worked for you. Well, I've worked for you. I've worked hard. I've given up my baseball games to work for you. But you haven't kept your word and you haven't taught me anything. You are a crook like everyone in town thinks you are. You're greedy. You want all the money and don't care of, don't take care of your employees. You made me wait and don't show me any respect. I'm only a little boy, but I deserve to be treated better. Rich dad rocked back in his swivel chair, hands up to his chin, and stared at me. Not bad, he said. In less than a month, you sound like most of my employees. What? I asked, not understanding what he was saying. I continued with my grievance. I thought you were going to keep your end of the bargain and teach me. Instead, you want to torture me. That's cruel. That's really cruel. I'm teaching you, Rich Dad said quietly. What have you taught me? Nothing, I said angrily. You haven't even talked to me once since I agreed to work for peanuts. 10 cents an hour, ha, huh, I should notify the government about you. We have child labor laws, you know. My dad works for the government, you know. Wow, said Rich Dad. Now you sound just like most of the people who used to work for me. People I've either fired or who have quit. So the people who are looking or who feel entitled to something. Right. They're always looking at getting things, not at 
giving things. So what do you have to say? I demanded. Feeling pretty brave for a little kid. You lied to me. I worked for you and you have not kept your word. You haven't taught me anything. How do you know that I've not taught you anything? Asked Rich Dad calmly. Well, you've never talked to me. I've worked for three weeks and you have not taught me anything. I said with a pout. Does teaching mean talking or a lecture? Rich Dad asked. Well, yes, I replied. That's how they teach you in school, he said, smiling. But that is not how life teaches you. And I would say that life is the best teacher of all. Most of the time, life does not talk to you. It just sort of pushes you around. Each push is life saying, wake up. There's something I want you to learn. So, so again, very clearly, right? One is a lecture. So it is basically knowledge. When that comes with experience, only then it becomes wisdom. So life is constantly teaching us. Every situation is there in our life to teach us something. Provided we wake up to learning and listening to what the lesson that is being taught to us. Shivangla, you're not muted. Oh, sorry. What is this man talking about? I asked myself silently. Life pushing me around? Was life talking to me? Now I knew I had to quit my job. I was talking to someone who needed to be locked up. If you learn life's lessons, you will do well. If not, life will just continue to push you around. Around. People do two things. Some just let life push them around. Others get angry and push back. But they push back against their boss or their job or their husband or wife. They do not know it's life that's pushing. I had no idea what he was talking about. Life pushes all of us around. Some people give up and others fight. I, a few lesson, sorry, a few learn the lesson and move on. They welcome life, pushing them around. To these few people, it means they need to learn, need and want to learn something. They learn and move on. Most quit, and a few like you fight. So this is important, right? Life pushes us around. Some people will give up. They'll quit. Others will fight. Some will learn a lesson and move on. And the others will welcome the challenge, right? Now, who do you think among these will actually work and become better at what they are doing? The guys who accept the challenge, the guys who say yes, the guys who learn the lesson and they move forward, right? They don't get stuck and they don't quit. So this is what, this is very, very important thing. Right? And he says clearly that most people quit, they'll keep shifting jobs or they'll start fighting back. The union baji that was going on was because of this. Rather than working and making it, they were constantly demanding things rather than working so that they automatically got the thing that they needed. I had no idea what he was talking about. Life pushes all of us around. Some people give up and others fight. A few learn the lessons and move on. They welcome life pushing them around. To these few people, it means they need and want to learn something. They learn and move on. Most quit and a few, like you, fight. Rich Dad stood and shut the creaky old window that needed repair. If you learn this lesson, you will grow into wise, wealthy, and happy young man. If you don't, you will spend your life blaming a job, low pay, 
or your boss for your problems. You live life always hoping for that big break that will solve all your money problems. So in the first case, right, they are taking responsibility for what is happening to them. And in the second case, they are constantly blaming the other person. That means they're not taking responsibility for themselves. This is again what we talked about in Zero Limits, that anything that comes into your awareness now, Zero Limits is taking one step forward, right? He's saying that anything that comes into your awareness, you're responsible for. So you are the creator of your reality. Over here, he's not saying that in so many words, but he's saying that when life is teaching you lessons, you need to learn the lessons. You are responsible for bringing that lesson into your life. Learn it, move forward and grow with it rather than starting a blame game, giving justification, right? When we look at it from the grid perspective, when you're justifying, when you're blaming, you're on the left side of the grid. And again, no manifestation or creation will take place from there. When we take responsibility, we learn and grow. We are moving from the right side of the grid. Rich Dad looked over at me to see if I was still listening. His eyes met mine. We stared at each other, communicating through our eyes. Finally, I looked away once I had absorbed his message. I knew he was right. I was blaming him and I did ask to learn. I was fighting. Rich Dad continued. Or... If you're the kind of person who has no guts, you just give up every time life pushes you. If you're that kind of person, you live all your life playing it safe, doing the right things, saving yourself for some event that never happens. Then you die a boring old man. You'll have lots of friends who really like you because you were such a nice, hardworking guy. But the truth is that you let life push you into submission. Deep down, you were terrified of taking risks. You really wanted to win, but the fear of losing was greater than the excitement of winning. Deep inside you, and only you will know, you didn't go for it. You chose to play it safe. So this is again, right? Moving from the known to the unknown. And when we are moving to the unknown, it requires a certain amount of tenacity. It requires a certain amount of uh, trust. It requires a certain amount of letting go of control. It requires you taking a risk. Now, if you're not willing to take a small amount of risk also, growth will never take place because you'll be stuck in that same syndrome. So when, when we ask this question, when was the last time you did something new? This is the same process, right? If you're not doing something new, you're not growing, you're stagnating. So if I'm not willing to take a risk, then automatically I am stagnating. Our eyes met again. You've been pushing me around, I asked. Some people might say that, smiled Rich Dad. I would say that I just gave you a taste of life. What taste of life? I asked. Still angry, but now curious and ready to learn. You boys are the first people who have ever asked me to teach them how to make money. I have more than 150 employees and not one of them has asked me what I know about money. They asked me for a job and a paycheck but never to teach them about money. So most will spend the best years of their lives working for money, not really understanding what it is they are working for. So this is very important, right? So why did he take them on? Because they were the first people to ask them how to make, ask him how to make money. The rest is like a paycheck. I'm working, I need a paycheck. That's it, right? So their whole life is going to revolve around that. Getting working, getting a paycheck, working, getting a paycheck, working, getting a paycheck. Where is the growth in that? There is no growth. And 99% of the people are stuck in that syndrome.
I was learning, I sat there listening intently. So when Mike told me you wanted to learn how to make money, I decided to design a course that mirrored life itself. I could talk until I was blue in the face, but you wouldn't hear a thing. So I decided to let life push you around a bit so you could hear me. That's why I only paid you 10 cents. So what is the lesson I learned from working for only 10 cents an hour? I asked that you're cheap and exploit your workers. Rich dad rocked back and laughed heartily. Finally, he said, you'd best change your point of view. Stop blaming me and thinking I'm the problem. If you think I'm the problem, then you have to change me. If you realize that you're the problem, then you can change yourself. Learn something and grow wiser. Most people want everyone else in the world to change, but themselves. Let me tell you, it's easier to change yourself than everyone else. So now this is really beautiful, right? You better change your point of view because if you're blaming someone, then you're not taking responsibility. And you can only change yourself. You can never change someone else, right? So it's very important that we start realizing this. We are seeing this in all the books that we are, we've been reading that we only have control of what we are experiencing. What is my experience? How is what I'm experiencing occur to me or what is occurring to me? Now, whatever is occurring to me today in this moment in time, sets the trajectory for what I'm going to experience in the future. Now, if a person keeps blaming someone else and not taking responsibility, then you are setting yourself up to constantly blame someone else and not grow. But the idea in life is to grow, to learn, to understand, and then to move forward, take the next step forward. But if we get stuck in the blame game and we keep hanging on to these things, they're like rocks in our backpack, right? When we are doing biofield tuning, when we are going through the field, when we are setting the earth stands and stuff, these blocks keep coming up. That what are you unnecessarily carrying in your system, which is not allowing you to flow, which is not allowing you to jack into the universal consciousness to actually start manifesting what you have come here for. Why? Because we are not taking responsibility. We are constantly blaming others. We are blaming the environment. We are blaming the situation. We are not seeing what we can do in those circumstances. So the idea is to look at what can be done, rather what can't be done, right? And it, at, at the end, it's you can only change yourself. You can never change someone else. And we have to drop bl the blame game and the justification game. These two games have to really drop. I don't understand, I said. Don't blame me for your problems, Rich Dad said, growing impatient. But you only pay me 10 cents. So what are you learning, Rich Dad asked, smiling. That you're cheap, I said with a sly grin. See, you think I'm the problem, said Rich Dad. But you are. Well, Keep that attitude and you'll learn nothing. Keep the attitude that I'm the problem and what choices do you have? Well, if you don't pay me more or show me more respect and teach me, I'll quit. Well put, Rich Dad said. And that's exactly what most people do. They quit and go looking for another job, a better opportunity and higher pay actually thinking that this will solve the problem. In most cases, it won't. So what should I do, I asked. Just take this measly 10 cents an hour and smile. Rich dad smile. That's what the other people do. What? But that's all they do, waiting for a raise, thinking that more money will solve their problems. Most just accept it and some take a second job working harder, but again, accepting a small paycheck. 
I sat staring at the floor, beginning to understand the rich lesson rich dad was presenting. I could sense it was a taste of life. Finally, I looked up and asked, so what will solve the problem? This, he said, leaning forward in his chair and tapping me gently on the head. This stuff between your ears. It was at that moment that Rich Dad shared the pivotal point of view that separated him from his employees and my poor dad and led him to eventually become one of the richest men in Hawaii. While my highly educated but poor dad struggled financially all his life, it was a singular point of view that made all the difference over a lifetime. Rich Dad explained this point of view over and over, which I call lesson number one. The poor and the middle class work for money. The rich have money work for them. So this is important, right? If you'll find that the people who get rich are not really working, they make their money work for them. So what, what does this mean? They make investments which generate a return. So they make their money work for them. But the poor people are just working for money. So they'll get a paycheck, they'll keep slogging, and then they'll keep doing, right? So this is again what uh, in the Vedanta talks, Nagarji is saying, anyone who has a job is a Shudra, right? So they are stuck at the lowest level of the, I, again, the caste system is about what is your propensity. It is not about the caste system itself. So you are a worker. So you will get paid and you'll work, right? So you're working at that mentality. That is your level of mentality. On that bright Saturday morning, I learned a completely different point of view from what I had been taught by my poor dad. At the age of nine, I understood that both dads wanted me to learn. Both dads encouraged me to study, but not the same thing. My highly educated dad recommended that I do what he did. Son, I want you to study hard, get good grades, so you can find a safe, secure job with a big company and make sure it has excellent benefits. My rich dad wanted me to learn how money works so I could make it work for me. These lessons I would learn through life with his guidance, not because of a classroom. My rich dad continued my first lesson. I'm glad you got angry about working for 10 cents an hour. If you hadn't got angry and had simply accepted it, I would have to tell you that I could not teach you. You see, True learning takes energy, passion, and a burning desire. Anger is a big part of that formula. For passion is anger and love combined. When it comes to money, most people want to play it safe and feel secure. So passion does not direct them. Fear does. This is important, right? Very, very well said over here. That passion is a combination of anger and love. When you're passionate about something and someone stands in your way for what you're doing, you get angry. You get annoyed because they're standing in your way. Whereas if you are wanting security, then you're constantly operating out of fear. The idea is to get passionate about what you're doing. Then everything else drops the passion takes over. And when you're passionate about something, then nothing in the world can really stop you. You will progress. But if you are playing it safe, then you will land up getting stagnated. And when you're operating out of fear, you're on the left side of the grid. When you're passionate, you're on the right side of the grid. Why? Because the core aspect of what is happening is love, right? The, again, the two main primordial emotions are love and fear. When you play it safe, you're operating out of fear. When you are passionate about something, you're operating out of love. So, 
Is that why they'll take jobs with low pay, I asked? Yes, said Rich Dad. Some people say I exploit people because I don't pay as much as the sugar plantation or the government. I say the people exploit themselves. It's their fear, not mine. But don't you feel you should pay them more? I asked. I don't have to. And besides, more money will not solve their problems. Just look at your dad. He makes a lot of money and he still can't pay his bills. Most people, given more money, only get into more debt. So this is again very important, right? If you do not know how to manage your money, you will never be over the... The water will always go above your head, right? You have to learn how to manage money. And this is something that we need to teach all our kids. It's not about earning money. It's about managing money, which is more important. So what's why, why, So that's why the 10 cents an hour, I said, smiling. It's a part of the lesson. That's right, smiled rich dad. You see, your dad went to school and got an excellent education. So he could get a high paying job, but he still has money problems because he never learned anything about money in school. On top of that, he believes in working for money. And you don't, I asked. No, not really, said Rich Dad. If you want to learn to work for money, then stay in school. That is a great place to learn to do that. But if you want to learn how to have money work for you, then I will teach you that, but only if you want to learn. Wouldn't everyone want to learn that, I asked? No, said Rich Dad, simply because it's easier to learn to work for money, especially if fear is your primary emotion when the subject of money is discussed. I don't understand, I said with a frown. Don't worry about that for now. Just know that it's Fear that keeps most people working at a job, the fear of not paying their bills, the fear of being fired, the fear of not having enough money, and the fear of starting over. That's the price of studying to learn a profession or trade and then working for money. Most people become a slave to money and then get angry at their boss. Learning to work have money work for you is a completely different course of study. I asked. Absolutely, Rich Dad answered. Absolutely. We sat in silence on that beautiful Hawaiian Saturday morning. My friends had just started their little league baseball game. But for some reason, I was now thankful I had decided to work for 10 cents an hour. I sensed that I was about to learn something my friends wouldn't learn in school. Ready to learn, asked Rich Dad. Absolutely, I said with a grin. I have kept my promise. I've been teaching you from afar, my Rich Dad said. At nine years old, you've gotten a taste of what it feels like to work for money. Just multiply your last month by 50 years. And you will have an idea of what most people spend their life doing. So what are most people doing? They'll go to work, they'll earn a check, they'll spend the money, they'll go back to work, right? So this is a cycle day in and day out. They're just doing that. They're not doing anything else. I don't understand, I said. How did you feel waiting in line to see me? Once to get hired and wants to ask for more money. Terrible, I said. If you choose to work for money, that is what life will be like, said Rich Dad. And how did you feel when Mrs. Martin dropped three dimes in your hand for three hours of work? I felt like it wasn't enough. I seemed, it seemed like nothing. I was disappointed, I said. And that is how most employees feel when they look at their paychecks. 
especially after all the tax and other deductions are taken out. At least you got 100%. You mean most workers don't get paid everything, I asked with amazement. Heavens no, said Rich Dad. The government always takes its share first. How do they do that, I asked. Taxes, said Rich Dad. You're taxed when you earn. You're taxed when you spend. You're taxed when you save. You're taxed when you die. Why do people let the government do that to them? The rich don't, said Rich Dad with a smile. The poor and the middle class do. I'll bet you that I earn more than your dad. Yet he pays more in taxes. <coughs> How can that be, I asked. At my age, that made no sense to me. Why would someone let the government do that to them? Rich dad rocked slowly and silently in his chair, just looking at me. Ready to learn, he asked. I nodded my head slowly. As I said, there is a lot to learn. Learning how to have money work for you is a lifetime study. Most people go to college for four years and their education ends. I already know that my study of money will continue over my lifetime. Simply because the more I find out, the more I find out, I need to know. Most people never study the subject. They go to work, get their paycheck, balance their checkbooks, and that's it. Then they wonder why they have money problems. They think that more money will solve the problem and don't realize that it's their lack of financial education that is the problem. So over here he says one thing, right? Most people never study the subject. So whatever you're doing, you must study what you're doing. Many people, when they go for a job, they'll say, this is my job. I don't need to do anything else. But the guy who really makes it will study, will grow, will understand the entire mechanics and working so that he can progress in what he is doing. But the main fact is that he's learning on the job. Anyone who's not learning on the job is dead, is going to go into the rat race, is going to get stuck wherever they, they are. So my dad has taught tax problems because he doesn't understand money? I asked, confused. Look, said Rich Dad, taxes are just one small section on learning how to have money work for you. Today, I just wanted to find out if you still have the passion to learn about money. Most people don't. They want to go to school learn a profession, have fun at their work, and earn lots of money. One day, they wake up with big money problems, and then they can't stop working. That's the price of only knowing how to work for money instead of studying how to have money work for you. So do you still have the passion to learn, asked Rich Dad. So now, again, taxes. How do you circumvent it, right? How do you make your money work for you? How do you save on whatever expenses you have? This becomes very, very important. I nodded my head. Good, said Rich Dad. Now get back to work. This time, I will pay you nothing. What? I asked in amazement. You heard me, nothing. You will work the same three hours every Saturday, but this time you will not be paid 10 cents per hour. You said you wanted to learn to not work for money, so I'm not going to pay you anything. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I've already had this conversation with Mike, and he's already working, dusting and stacking canned goods for free. You'd better hurry and get back there. That's not fair, I shouted. You've got to pay something. You said you wanted to learn. If you don't learn this now, you'll grow up to be like the two women and the older man. 
sitting in my living room, working for money and hoping I don't fire them. Or like your dad, earning lots of money only to be in debt up to his eyeballs, hoping more money will solve the problem. If that's what you want, I'll go back to our original deal of 10 cents an hour. Or you can do what most adults do, complain that there is not enough pay, quit and go looking for another job. But so, so basically now he has a choice, right? He needs to understand that does he want to learn or he wants to earn the money. And most people who are in, a, in the salaried class in America also, they are up to their neck in debt, right? Also, they live paycheck to paycheck. They really don't have any money. I mean, literally anyone you speak to, they don't have money. I mean, in the normal working class. But what do I do, I asked. Rich dad tapped me on the head. Use this, he said. If you use it well, you will soon thank me for giving you an opportunity and you will grow into a rich man. I stood there, still not believing what a raw deal I was handed. I came to ask for a raise, and somehow I was instead working for nothing. Rich Dad tapped me on the head again and said, use this, now get out of here and get back to work. Lesson one, the rich don't work for money. I didn't tell my poor dad I wasn't being paid. He wouldn't have understood and I didn't want to try to explain something I didn't understand myself. For three more weeks, Mike and I worked three hours every Saturday for nothing. The work didn't bother me and the routine got easier, but it was the missed baseball games and not being able to afford to buy a few comic books that got to me. Rich Dad stopped by at noon on the third week. We heard his truck pull up in the parking lot and sputter when the engine was turned off. He entered the store and greeted Mrs. Martin with a hug. After finding out how things were going on in the store, he reached into the ice cream freezer, pulled out two bars, paid for them, and signal to Mike and me. Let's go for a walk, boys. We crossed the street, dodging a few cars, and walked across a large grassy field where a few adults were pay playing softball. Sitting down at a lone picnic table, he handed Mike and me the treats. How's it going, boys? Okay, Mike said. I nodded in agreement. Learn anything yet? Rich Dad asked. Mike and I looked at each other, shrugged our shoulders, and shook our heads in unison. Avoiding one of life's biggest traps. Well, you boys had better start thinking. You're staring at one of life's biggest lessons. If you learn it, you'll enjoy a life of great freedom and security. If you don't, you'll wind up like Mrs. Martin and most of the people playing softball in this park. They work very hard for little money, clinging to the illusion of job security and looking forward to a three-week vacation each year and maybe a skimpy pension after 45 years of service. If that excites you, I'll give you a raise to 25 cents an hour. But these are good, hardworking people. Are you making fun of them? I demanded. A smile came over Rich Dad's face. Mrs. Martin is like a mother to me. I would never be that cruel. I may sound unkind because I'm doing my best to point something out to the two of you. I want to expand your point of view so you can see something most people never have the benefit of seeing because their vision is too narrow. Most people never see the trap they are in. Mike and I sat there uncertain of his message. He sounded cruel, yet we could sense he was trying to drive home a point. 
With a smile, rich dad said, doesn't that 25 cents an hour sound good? Doesn't it make your heart beat a little faster? I shook my head no, but it really did. 25 cents an hour would be big bucks to me. Okay, I'll pay you a dollar an hour, rich dad said with a sly grin. Now my heart started to race. My brain was screaming. Take it, take it. I could not believe what I was hearing. Still, I said nothing. Okay, two dollars an hour. My little brain and heart nearly exploded. After all, it was 1956 and being paid two dollars an hour would have made me the richest kid in the world. I couldn't imagine earning that kind of money. I wanted to say yes. I wanted the deal. I could picture a new bicycle, new baseball glove, and the ad adoration of my friends when I flashed some cash. On top of that, Jimmy and his rich friends could never call me poor again. But somehow, my mouth stayed shut. The ice cream had melted and was running down my hand. Rich Dad was looking at two boys staring back at him eyes wide open and brains empty. He was testing us and he knew there was a part of our emotions that wanted to take the deal. He understood that every person has a weak and needy part of their soul that can be bought. And he knew that every individual also had a part of their soul that was resilient and could never be bought. It was only a question of which one was stronger. Okay, five dollars an hour. Suddenly, I was silent. Something had changed. The offer was too big and ridiculous. Not many grown-ups in 1956 made more than that. But quickly, my temptation disappeared and calm set in. Slowly, I turned to my left to look at Mike. He looked back at me. The part of my soul that was weak and needy was silenced. That, the part of me that had no price took over. I knew Mike had gotten to that point too. People's lives are forever controlled by two emotions, fear and greed. Good, Rich Dad said softly. Most people have a price and they have a price because of human emotions named fear and greed. First, the fear of being without money motivates us to work hard. And then once we get that paycheck, greed or desire starts us thinking about all the wonderful things money can buy. The pattern is then set. So what's the pattern? You earn the money. And then you start thinking what I can buy with this. And then you buy it, right? Then again, you earn the money and you'll buy something else. Then again, you'll earn the money and you'll buy something else. And then you get into a pattern. You'll get into that rigmarole of constantly buying things, material things. Again, now there's a lesson in that also. You're muted. What pattern, I asked. The pattern of get up, go to work, pay bills, get up, go to work, pay bills. People's lives are forever controlled by two emotions, fear and greed. Offer them more money and they continue the cycle by increasing their spending. This is what I call the rat race. There is another way, Mike asked. Yes, said Rich Dad slowly, but only a few people find it. And what is that way, Mike asked. That's what I hope you boys will learn as you work and study with me. That is why I took away all forms of pay. Any hints, Mike asked. We're kind of tired of working hard, especially for nothing. 
Well, the first step is telling the truth, said Rich Dad. We haven't been lying, I said. <coughs> Sorry. I did not say you were lying. I said to tell the truth. Rich Dad retorted. The truth about what? I asked. How you're feeling, Rich Dad said. You don't have to say it to anyone else. Just admit it to yourself. You mean the people in this park, the people who work for you, Mrs. Martin, they don't do that? I asked. I doubt it, said Rich Dad. Instead, they feel the fear of not having money. They don't confront it logically. They react emotionally instead of using their heads, Rich Dad said. Then they get a few bucks in their hands and again, the emotions of joy, desire and greed take over. And again, they react instead of think. So the emotions control their brain, Mike said. That's correct, said Rich Dad. Instead of admitting the truth about how they feel, they react to their feelings and fail to think. They feel the fear, so they go to work, hoping that money will soothe the fear, but it doesn't. It continues to haunt them and they return to work, hoping again that money will calm their fears. And again, it doesn't. Fear keeps them in this trap of working, earning money, working, earning money, hoping the fear will go away. But every day they get up and that old fear wakes up with them. For millions of people, that old fear keeps them awake all night, causing a night of turmoil and worry. So they get up and go to work hoping that a paycheck will kill that fear gnawing at their soul. Money is running their lives, and they refuse to tell the truth about that. Money is in control of their emotions and their souls. Rich Dad sat quietly, letting his words sink in. Mike and I heard what he said, but didn't understand fully what he was talking about. I just knew that I often wondered, why grown-ups hurried off to work. It did not seem like much fun and they never looked that happy, but something kept them going. Realizing we had absorbed as much as possible of what he was talking about, Rich Dad said, I want you boys to avoid that trap. That is really what I want to teach you, not just to be rich because being rich does not solve the problem. It doesn't, I asked, surprised. No, it doesn't. Let me explain the other emotion, desire. Some call it greed, but I prefer desire. It's perfectly normal to de desire something better, prettier, more fun or exciting. So people also work for money because of desire. They desire money for the joy they think it can buy. But the joy that money brings is often short-lived. And they soon need more money for more joy, more pleasure, more comfort, and more security. So they keep working, thinking money will soothe their souls that are troubled by fear and desire. But money can't do that. So again, so you have fear. That is the first emotion. And then the second emotion is desire. That means, again, acquiring things, wanting something. Okay, desiring something. That's the next level. Shunglai, you're muted. Even rich people do this, Mike asked. Rich people included said Rich Dad. In fact, the reason many rich people are rich isn't because of desire, but because of fear. They believe that money can eliminate the fear of being poor. 
so they amass tons of it only to find the fear gets worse now they fear losing the money i have friends who keep working even though they have plenty i know people who have millions who are more afraid now than when they were poor they are terrified of losing it all the fears that drove them to get rich got worse that weak and needy part of their soul is actually screaming louder they don't want to lose the big houses the cars and the high life money has bought them they worry about what their friends would say if they got lost all their money many are emotionally desperate and neurotic although they look rich and have more money so again it's your attitude about money which is important right but most of the people they are and you know the, the the thing of getting more and more and more is because again the fear is there at the end of the day that if i lose it then what will happen so they keep amassing more and more not realizing what it is doing to them so is a poor man happier i asked no i don't think so replied rich dad the avoidance of money is just as psychotic as being attached to money okay i think we can stop here